very important that Van Lee Dodds, our genetic researcher at, at UCL, and I can see Jane <laughs> nodding. We can't do this without you. And without people like Fiona. So God bless Fiona. So I'm, uh, I'm going to give a brief little discussion about what we do, which is look at the genetics of PCD. I won't go hugely, there's a lot of genes that cause PCD. I won't go hugely into their biology, I'll try and summarise it. And I want to try and just get across to you the, um, a little bit about the 100,000 Genomes Project that uh, Fiona has touched upon, and just how we can uh, see the importance of genetics and how we can take things forward. Uh, so I'm at, the, I'm at University College London, uh, there's Great Ormond Street Hospital, and then we're in the middle with the Research Institute that's uh, next door to Great Ormond Street, uh, but we're the UCL Research Department. And I very much, uh, we've worked uh, completely uh, for many years with the, the PCD clinical network and uh, the leads of that service like Jane uh, Lucas who's here today. I just thought this was um, funny, we're scientists and uh, we try to do a bit of public engagement, which is what this is. Um, so we had a, a little, uh, we had somebody coming in from the STEM ambassadors team. So STEM is a science um, subject. And part of our job is to go and tell people what um, what we do. So they, uh, the STEM ambassadors told us the impact of school children of talking to scientists. So these are before and after pictures. This is the typical scientist that they imagined. Uh, primary school kids, white coat, mad hair, some substance in a, in a tube. After talking to scientists, they got a, a slightly different uh, opinion. So I'm, I'm hoping that, that we here today, uh, please do talk to us and we really want to try and get across to you what we do in an understandable way. We're not marine biologists, but that was obviously who they talk, talk to. So from UCL here today, and they're both over here, Amy will be speaking about um, her genetic uh, and molecular studies on the sperm and fertility of males with PCD. Mitali's uh, worked with me for many years in a lab on the genetics, so a lot of what I'm showing today is, is her work. So PCD, I'm um, hoping most people ha have been aware during their interactions with the NHS and clinicians and doctors that it's a recessive disease. That means that you have two parents who have one, what we call, mutation in the DNA uh, that they pass on to their children, usually. So that means there's a one in four chance uh, in, in that type of family. Uh, they're carriers, and if you just have one mutation, you don't have PCD, but when you have two, one from your mother and one from your father, and you, you can get PCD, that's how it's inherited. So that's a 25% or one in four chance of, of offspring, of, of carriers of, of PCD um, change in the DNA. There are also three genes we know about that are X-linked. So they're genes that are on the X chromosome, and um, men have one X chromosome, women have two. And so these, uh, the inheritance comes from an affected mum who's a carrier, uh, and then there's a, actually um, a one in two chance of, of the sons from that type of um, union getting PCD, so that's a higher chance in males. There won't be any affected uh, daughters, they'll, they'll have a half chance of being a carrier. So when we look at the, in the lungs and we look at the cilia, and they're not beating in PCD, and most of you may know that the way you get tested for that is by a nasal sample where the clinicians are trying to get right to the back of your, uh, the nose to scrape some ciliated cells from your nasal turbinate. And that's the model that we use. Um, the entire, well, the, the, the upper airways are highly ciliated. The trachea is probably the most ciliated part of the body. And we can take a nose sample to form a, a biological model of what's going on. And what you see is this sort of thing. I don't know how many people have seen a movie of the, their nose cilia beating. That's a normal brush sample, go forward and backward. That's the airway surface. In PCD, the, the video is moving a little bit, but you can see that the cilia are static. So that's what happens, and that's because of these inherited uh, problems that I'm going to talk about. And it affects, generally speaking, about 1 in 10 to 1 in 15,000 people. But we know that this is a higher incidence of PCD in, in certain populations, in particular where there's consanguineous or cousin marriage. There's a, like all um, 
Obsessive diseases like PCD, there's a higher incidence when there's a cousin marriage in the population. So uh, we take those no cells, and these days uh, it's much, much easier to be able to grow them in a dish. Uh, so this airway surface is made up of these ciliated cells, there's the cell body, and there's the fringe of cilia when you get a single cell. But it actually sits in quite a complicated lining. There are cells that produce the mucus that we cough up, and there's these ciliated cells that move the mucus along. And the whole point of that system is to get rid of inhaled pathogens. So, so that's a part of the problem in PCD when it's not working. So we're looking for the gene mutations that cause PCD. <clears throat> and in these respiratory cells, we can look at them in a, in a molecular way. So these things here in your nose, we can get them out. And if you look at them uh, just in a singular fashion, then you can see this. Um, here we stain the the nucleus where the DNA is, and we've stained the, the cilia with a different marker, uh, and, when, and we can try and see what's going on. But for DNA, it's all contained in this nucleus structure. So DNA is not in the, in the cilia themselves, it's in the cell body. And what we do when we take a nasal sample is we're going to get those cells, and we want to extract what's in there, your genetic information. And uh, DNA is a really, really long structure. So in every single cell of the body, we've got about two metres of um, DNA. We've got trillions of cells. They say if you get all the DNA in your body, it will go to the moon and back something like 60 times. It's, it's vast. And what uh, has happened in PCD is that a single piece of that um, DNA is altered and different from uh, people who don't have PCD. So once again, uh, DNA is just that vast um, 3 billion um, DNA bases, the instructions to make all of the body, all of the proteins in the body. It's packaged into these things called chromosomes. If you get those apart and look at the DNA string, you, you see this DNA double helix that um, hopefully anyone who's done a, uh, a biology A level might have heard about the DNA double helix. So there's 22,000 genes. In, encoded by the DNA. And we know that about a thousand of those are what you need to make your cilia. So it's quite a large proportion of 22,000 genes actually. The cilia are very important structures. Uh, about a thousand genes uh, code the, the DNA. Oh, sorry, code the cilia. So what happens in PCD? The normal DNA helix has got a, a so called mutation. Something's happened, a little blip's happened doesn't read correctly and the proteins aren't made correctly and we can um, look at DNA sequence to try and detect these minute changes and we know that around 40 genes cause PCD so 1,000 of the genes that make a cilia cell 40 of those can be affected and, and cause PCD so uh, they're all all of them so far that have been di discovered are um, involved in assembly of the cilia, growth of the cilia out from the cell, and the, the finer structure of the cilia. So we understand quite well about their functions. This is not to amaze you with the, <laughs> the number of genes. It's more to tell you that things have speeded up. So I've been in uh, PCD genetics since about the year 2000, that's nearly 20 years, and from 2012, we had this thing called next generation sequencing, and that's revolutionised all of genetics. It's a much easier way to find the genes, so there's been a sort of bonanza of uh, finding these genes and understanding about the, the disease biology. And it does mean that um, about 70 to 80 percent of patients who have PCD are well characterised for the PCD. Uh, 70 to 80 of them, 70 to 80 percent will have definitely have a mutation in one of those genes. So that's a really high uh, level of, of um, diagnosis that we can now make. If you can imagine just seven years ago, when we didn't know about all this lot of genes, um, we'd have been much less successful at being able to diagnose PCD genetically. Now we know a huge amount more, but we're still about 30 percent of patients, 20, 30 percent, uh, where we don't know what the genetic cause is. Um, and uh, 
the structure, I mentioned the structure can be affected in PCB. So here's a cilium. If you, it's sticking out of the cell. If you chopped it across, this is typically what we look at in the lab, the cross section of the cilia is quite complicated. You can start to appreciate why 44 genes and probably more make this structure complicated. It, it moves, it's a self-generated movement. Uh, hydrolyzes ATP, does all sorts of complicated things. Uh, in, a, in a healthy person, this would be the typical cross section. It's a very, very conserved uh, structure. In a PCB patient, this I'm just showing one where these little diamond arms are gone. And that means that the cilia is static. So there are structural changes, this high level structure uh, is, is changed, and we look at that uh, using the electron microscope. So the 44 genes that we know about, um, they're very much, with you, we know if you've got this gene that you'll, you'll get this type of defect of the cell. So I mentioned the loss of dining arms, we know there's a bunch of genes that cause that. And there's um, genes that cause a, a sort of disorganisation of all the microtubules, if you can see that compared to the normal cross section, it's like you've taken away the spokes of a, a bicycle wheel bit of a, a messed up cilium, can't move properly. There's cilia that have lost their central pair, uh, and there's little more uh, minor defects, if there's these little links between the tubules. So we get a very good correlation, and we can understand that uh, in the movie, if your cilia moves in this particular way, if you've got this type of structural defect, we can start to predict what sort of gene mutation you will have. And I won't go hugely into the biology, but this is a recent story. Uh, just in the last couple of years, we found mutations in two um, genes that code for the dining arms. I mentioned those little structures. So again, the healthy controls beating. And there's two different dining arm genes uh, which are, have mutations in PCB patients. One is CNH9, one is CNH11. And I'm just wondering if you can look at those movies and actually see why that's only different from the normal person. I don't know how well that is projecting. It's really very subtle. So I showed you a video where it's static. These patients don't have static cilia. They actually have quite a lot of movement. So they're quite difficult to diagnose actually. Why are they any different from normal? And it's really, really subtle. So we now know from uh, biology, DNH11 sits at bottom half of the cilia, DNH9 sits at the top. So this is subtle, I think. If you have DNH11 mutation, the bottom of your cilia isn't moving, but the top is. Can you see that? That's very stiff, but you get this. So it's sometimes called hyperkinetic. Initially, people thought they were beating super fast, but what it is, is it's just half beating. Whereas DNH9 is super subtle. Uh, I think it's really very hard to spot there's anything going on here at all. There's movement at the bottom, but the top is, is static. So it's subtle. <laughs> and um, Jane and her laboratory, they do these um, videos all the time. All our movies are not done by us. We, we borrow them from the clinicians. And I think it's quite fantastic. But uh, the point I'm getting here is that those patients with DNH9 would took a long time to understand uh, what the cause of their disease was and whether they actually had PCD. Because not only did they have a lot of movement, a lot of the clinical tests like nitric oxide testing can be quite normal because of the amount of movement. So uh, really genetics is what uh, gave the diagnosis and told that patient that they had PCD, which is, as you know, is a, is a significant thing to get uh, enrolled into the PCD service if you're a patient. You know, you have to have this diagnosis. So, uh, you know, so these are the 44 genes. We know a lot more about them than DNH11 and DNH9. DNH11 and DNH9, I just told you about, sit in these arms. Uh, and as mentioned, there's a whole bunch of genes to do with assembling the, the cilia, the little links, the central apparatus, and the radial phase. So the biology has been uh, really very interesting to be involved in. There's two important genes, multicillin and CCNN, that are involved in how the cilia grow up out of the cell. So that was a completely novel biology, again, <coughs> revealed by genetics a couple of years ago. So the, the long and short of it is that genetics is really important for diagnostics and increasingly used as a test for PCD. And we have European guidelines and 
American guidelines for how you diagnose an PCB patient. In the UK, this is probably changing, if, if you look like a PCB patient, you'll have nitric oxide testing, VOs, and EM structural testing. And, and then probably when you're quite well characterized, you go for genetics. Uh, in some of these difficult cases, genetics comes a bit further up the pathway. In America, you probably go straight for genetics. They're, they're uh, not all gung-ho about genetics. So I think these things are changing. Uh, and as I mentioned, this next generation sequencing technology is incredible. <clears throat> so all the 44 genes can be tested in a, in a single test. You stick um, the DNA extracted from a patient into um, a, a high seq or a neck seq a DNA sequencer, and you can look at them all together. So the cost of screening, uh, the cost of screening, and the understanding of the results is is getting better and better. Uh, okay. So why why do we care? Why is it important? Why why do you want to know about your PCD mutations? So I've mentioned diagnosis, and I just thought I might throw it out to the room. If anyone has any opinion what other things are helpful for genetic research, why I bother to keep on the list? We don't list it already. Do you, does anyone have an opinion about that? Yes? Trying try to find a cure. Yes, fantastic. Trying to find a cure. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I think counselling is a big issue. Yeah, really very important. Yeah. Anything else? I think those are very important. I only have four points myself. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we can do prognosis, which is we can understand a tiny bit more from your genetics about how your disease is going to uh, follow down the clinical course. Family matters, exactly what you said, proper counselling. So actually, um, with, it's only with genetics that you can tell whether someone in the family carries a mutation. If you're a carrier, if you're a parent, if you're an affected sibling, if you're an unaffected sibling, we don't know just by looking at you whether you carry one copy of the mutation and you're unaffected carrier or whether you don't carry any mutation whatsoever. And that might be of interest, maybe particular, particularly in, in a cousin marriage sort of population, you might want to know about your carrier status uh, and to have correct genetic counselling and therapy, genetic therapy. So we're slowly, slowly, slowly inching towards genetic therapies. Uh, so the second half of my uh, talk, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what genetics can tell us about your PCD disease. So this is a difficult graph just to take in, but what it is is um, the number of PCD patients with different genes and who's got normal situs, the normal positioning of the heart, and who's got situs inversus, the, the mirror image reversal that we know affects about 50% of patients. Uh, we did a big survey in 200 families uh, across the clinical network and we found a set of nine genes at the time, we looked at that a couple of years ago, uh, nine genes where you never ever see a patient with sinus inversus. And, and we understand a little bit about why that is. Then biologically they don't disturb the cilia, the, the embryonic cilia that um, cause sinus determination. So, does that matter? Sinus inversus doesn't really medically affect you. Uh, we know that um, if you have sinus inversus, you have an increased uh, risk of heart defects, cardiac defects that are laterality related. So that's important for understanding whether you may have a, a heart defect and, and whether you really don't have to worry about it. So that was very interesting. And they're, they're to do with the central pair structure and the multi-ciliogenesis program. You can imagine in, in your throat you have um, uh, multi-cilia, but the cilia that determine your cytosol, cell, they're single cilia in the embryo, so the, the multi-ciliogenesis genes don't matter for those. Okay. Um, I can't, don't really have time to go into it a lot, and some of you might even have seen me put this slide up before, and it's potentially a bit out of date as well. I just really want to say that for different genes, there are some clinical, clinically important conclusions that are arising. So I mentioned the genes where there's no situs abnormalities and, and then really no risk of cardiac defects arising from your PCD. And there are some mutations, Annie's going to talk to us about genes that maybe don't cause male infertility a little bit 
Uh, and then there are some genes where we really don't quite understand why yet, but they're connected with worse lung function. So those multicellular genesis genes, the CCNO multicellular I mentioned, those patients are much more uh, badly affected for their lung disease, they're more prone to hydrocephalus, so to accumulation of fluid in the brain, uh, but they don't have some abnormalities. There are some other genes that are connected with slightly milder um, disease. And you can imagine when we're looking for gene changes, there might be more severe genetic changes and milder ones, uh, and the milder ones maybe don't, don't cause such severe disease. And my last slide on this is um, a study done by a PhD student, um, Mahmoud Fassad, recently, uh, that we haven't published yet. Um, he looked at PCD genes in different populations. So um, we do have many European people, but you'd heard though, in, in England, Northern Europe, in North European uh, ancestry um, patients, and he looked at 60 of those. Arabic patients, Arabic origin, 24 of those, and um, South Asian uh, origin patients, of, patients from the, the Indian subcontinent from Pakistan, uh, there's 25 of those. <clears throat> and what you can see is that these different populations have different gene mutations. So uh, there's two genes that in North European, like me, would be very important causes of PCD, DH5, DH11. They really don't affect um, the Arabic population that we, as we tested. At the Arabic, PCD patients had uh, different mutations that were prevalent and in the um, CCDC gene. And then in South Asian population, and um, as you may know, in the north of England, there's a lot of South Asian origin families, and uh, uh, there's a high prevalence of uh, families of, of South Asian origin, particularly in PCD clinics. They, again, they don't have uh, prominent mutations in these two genes. They have uh, two genes, CCDC103 and LMR26, where they're much more likely to be mutated. Uh, and up to half might be explained, not, not only by just two genes, but actually just a single mutation in both of those genes. So you, we can really start to target um, genetics in particular populations and maybe start to predict who's going to get what type of PCD in which populations. Uh, I'm going to finish uh, on two things. One is um, therapy. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the 100,000 Genos Project. So, um, uh, Natalia here would love to talk to you about her work <laughs> on antisense oligonucleotide therapy. So, um, there's a particular type of um, disease mutation in PCD, uh, it's called gene splicing mutation. And what happens is, uh, instead of a, a normal uh, gene being expressed, you get extra pieces of DNA are inserted because of errors in the, the DNA mechanism, um, and then the proteins are, are aberrant and the cilia don't work properly. We can target little tiny um, antisense oligos or AONs, they're just tiny pieces of DNA that block this effect. And Natalia's been getting really terrific results uh, in, a, in model systems at the moment, where um, by her molecular work here, you can see that uh, the normal gene would be a small product, and the, the mutated gene would get a bigger product. So um, she's been testing various different chemistries of AONs, uh, and she can see increasing amounts of the rescued gene. So these are um, AONs that haven't worked in, in patients, so, sorry, when we're looking at the mutation. So the mutation is the bigger thing on this gel, and the wild type uh, gene being rescued back is a smaller thing, and there's a couple of different types of AON where we're really very optimistic that we can rescue back the normal gene expression. That's a very brief explanation of AONs. Uh, we have a quite a complicated project that we've submitted for getting funding where we're going to work on patient samples. So people who have these splicing mutations grow their, um, their airway cells and do all the various different tests to see whether we can rescue back the normal function of the cilia uh, with and without the AON treatment. And uh, it's a very long road to getting anywhere uh, near towards treatment in a patient. But we know that AONs have worked for other diseases, particularly Duchenne muscular dystrophy, spinomuscular atrophy. So we're not reinventing the wheel at all. Uh, we're just 
adopting that sort of technology for PCD, and we're working <coughs> with an expert who's just joined the department who's working on AI. So when so we know that um, about 15% of patients have that type of splicing mutation. There are different types of mutation where different types of genetic therapy uh, might be applicable. So another group you may know, Chris Callahan, uh, who's another of the PCD uh, clinical leads. They're working on a particular type of mutation um, called premature termination codon mutation. So your PCD proteins are truncated. There are certain drugs that will read through that truncation to actually rescue back the normal protein. So they have an ACCI program funded for doing that. There's lots and lots that we hear about genome editing in, in the newspapers that, in theory, could kind of perhaps correct every gene uh, defect in PCD. Uh, and you, similarly, you can put genes back in. So I think there's sort of optimistic scope for therapy uh, in the future, some of which we're closer to actually seeing come to fruition. <coughs> right, lastly, do you remember him? <laughs> that is uh, the instigator of the 100,000 Genomes Project. Um, so he did, do, uh, he did do something good, David Cameron. And he announced uh, <coughs> the 100,000 Genomes Project. And actually, the UK are, are totally world leading in their 100,000 Genomes Project. America uh, and other countries followed our lead in this. It's really fantastic idea to start to make use of things like that next generation sequencing technique and try and put it into the NHS. So maybe one day you sit down with your doctor or your GP and they're looking at your DNA sequence and they're making some conclusions about your, your disease from that. Um, so a large amount of money, and maybe the UK had money to fund this project. Um, so the 100,000 Genomes project is now closed. It was 100,000 genomes. So a genome is looking at all DNA. It's quite an expensive technique. We don't do genome sequences. We look at these smaller gene panels. But as we heard from Fiona, uh, we had the first PCD diagnosis from the 100,000 Genomes project. That's 100,000 genomes, which is 70,000 patients and their families. Uh, it was both rare disease and cancer. Uh, so rare disease, including PCD, recruitment stopped in September 2018. We're now looking at and, and, uh, cancer patients shortly afterwards. And uh, I, myself, uh, our team, and Jane's team, and the clinical leads, uh, and their research, lab, research labs are all part of the clinical interpretation partnerships of the 100,000 Genomes Project. So that means we help to interpret and find the mutations from people who've had their genome sequence. And we are one of apparently 3,300 uh, researchers worldwide doing that. So in the 100,000 patient cohort, about 1% of them have got ciliopathies. PCD is, is one of the ciliopathies. There's, there's other ciliopathies I haven't touched upon. Um, <clears throat> so in the end, it was 6,182 rare disease patients. That's 190 rare diseases. There's about 8,000 known rare diseases, and 1% with um, a ciliopathy. Uh, we actually have um, got 274 patients with rare respiratory disease and there's 126 PCD patients in 100,000 waiting for their results. And there's also 148 uh, non-CF4 Kexis patients and James will be prof Tom, and we'll be talking about he's on his way. <laughs> so that's very important. We, we already have hints actually that amongst the non-CF4 Kexis patients that there's some PCD PCD genes cropping up. So there's some hidden PCD in the 100,000. And I just think it's incredible. It's incredible that he's, the UK is pioneering it. Uh, it is changing uh, the face of our clinical medicine in this country. And those are going to be um, fantastic patients to work on and understand more about PCD. And indeed, um, it's not published yet, but there's a brand new gene that's um, arisen from uh, work at the Brompton on PCD cases, it's called COX-J1, and it seems to be a dominant form of PCD. So I mentioned uh, PCD is normally recessive, recessive and X-linked recessive. If you're dominant, it means with one copy of the mutation, you have the disease, so that's uh, very, very unusual. It's been 
thought about for a while that they were dominant PCD cases. Um, <clears throat> for example, um, a mother gets married a few different times and has a child with PCD with different um, dads. That does imply something quite unusual. Uh, it, it would imply dominant disease. So we've, we've seen reports of that in the literature, but this seems to be the first true dominant form of PCD. And so that should be coming out soon, hopefully. So the future is bright. Um, they've just announced 50 million genomes. So they're going to have a massive expansion of the 100,000 genomes project. It's gone tremendously well. Uh, I think patients haven't really seen their results yet, but you have to believe them. They've, they've sequenced all the thousands and thousands of genomes, and we will get that data. We sort of work through it. Uh, but it's a really fantastic thing of this National Genome Medicine Service. Uh, I don't pretend to know everything about it, and I'm very grateful, actually, Gabrielle Weeway from Southampton gave me these slides, uh, all my 100,000 genomes project slides. But it is a reconfiguration of um, clinical genetic services, and there's, a, for example, a London, North and South, um, Jane would have been Wessex, um, uh, Genetics, Genome Medicine Centre for the Southampton Clinic patients. Um, so that's where all the genetics in the future is going to be uh, funded from, from the NHS. Uh, I've probably gone on way too long, so I'm going to finish. Just as well, we had extra time. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, um, and thanks for listening.